lest the name polycystic ovary syndrome muddy the water, this is a metabolic problem. It is the most common infertil uh, infertility in women. And it's no coincidence that insulin resistance happens to be the single most common problem full stop. These two are intimately connected. And it's just a further reflection of how relevant insulin is throughout the body. Literally, every single cell of the body responds to insulin in some way. And the ovaries are no different. And just as there are so many different types of cells, it's no surprise that insulin does different things at different cells. And what it does at the ovaries is totally different than what it does to others, even what it does within specific cells of the ovaries, like the theca cells, which will be a cell of focus for us today. Now, Steve, to get things um, going with this metabolic classroom discussion, can you share with us what is the role of, of the estrogens, that small little family of the prototypical female sex hormones in female fertility? Yeah, the, you know, female fertility really relies a lot on the female sex hormones, particularly FSH and LH, which is follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone. And those come from the hypothalamus uh, to the pituitary, then down to the ovary. And that's kind of an axis that's really important in reproductive health. Uh, and all of those are relevant uh, in this situation and in, in, in every woman. And, and, uh, really that FSH and LH goes to the ovary uh, and then uh, el elicits a response of releasing estrogen or uh, progesterone. Uh, and those are, are related, the androgens, the uh, testosterone, progesterone, and, and estrogen are related and they, they function in different areas in the body differently, but the ovary in particular releases uh, a, a large amount of estrogen and also the test a large amount of the testosterone in the female body as well. Yeah, typically, uh, typically as a kind of a basic rule, the FSH uh, especially creates an estrogen rise, and then um, the LH will then uh, elicit progesterone to start to rise, and then that progesterone either stays high, progesterone meaning pro gestation uh, or uh, pro pregnancy, uh, that will then either stay high if a, if a woman is pregnant and creates, a uh, of, uh, the follicle turns into, uh, the, uh, the, the hormone secreting a portion of, of the pregnancy, mm -hmm. or if that doesn't happen and the pr person doesn't get pregnant, then that progesterone drops. The word ovulation refers to one actual emission or, or the ovary actually releasing the egg. It's really a fascinating process in that some people think that, you know, the left ovary ovulates, then it's the right's turn, then it's yeah. the left's turn. And that's not actually how it works. The, the body with this FSH, FSH is follicle stimulating hormone, and that creates follicles to uh, these eggs that are stored at birth. And even before birth at gestation, a, wo a woman will create all the eggs within her body, and those will be then activated, a few of them will be activated until one dominant follicle will kind of take over hormonally and become the, uh, the ovulatory follicle uh, stimulated by that FSH initially. And then uh, that ovulation triggered by that LH surge will then release that ovary where the fallopian tubes will be able to go and, and or release the mm -hmm. egg, I should say. And the fallopian tube can then get that egg, bring it into the uterus, and the sperm can meet with that, and then it can implant within the uterus to, uh, to cause a pregnancy. So Steve, how does insulin mess it up? So the process you just described was the normal physiological process of ovulation. How do things get pathophysiological, or how do things go wrong when insulin suddenly wants to join the party? That's a great question, and particularly in the situation of PCOS, which is that polycystic ovary syndrome. And it's a syndrome that has three uh, main things, main categories that, that it has to have. It has to have oligomenorrhea, which is um, which means uh, more distant or longer menstruation, meaning people don't have normal regular periods. So that's one thing it could have in it. Uh, another thing is uh, hyperandrogenism. So that means high testosterone or 
testosterone-like substances where people have clinically elevated testosterone. And then, um, and then it has all these cysts on the ovary. Other kind of more uh, associations with that uh, are also um, this insulin resistance and metabolic disease that is part of it. So in PCOS, the metabolic portion of it is not the actual uh, diagnostic criteria that we use, but we inevitably see it. How does PCOS work is, is still up for debate. I think there's quite a bit of debate. There's definitely a genetic component that drives that. Uh, but there's also a physiologic component, uh, particularly that has to do with obesity that can drive uh, that. Some people say that it has to have a two hit hypothesis where you have a genetic predisposition to have this insulin resistance, to have uh, anovulatory or oligoovulatory, meaning low ovulation. Uh, and then on top of that, when, if people hit a certain point uh, metabolically with obesity or other insulin resistance, then they kind of cross that tipping point. Um, but not all people are the same with PCOS. Some mm -hmm. people uh, are, are quite thin uh, and have PCOS. Some people are, have more fat in their body and, and so they don't always follow the same mold, but there is a typical one. You've mentioned how uh, testosterone and androgens, the prototypical male sex hormones, but of course that's an oversimplification. All men have both androgens and estrogens. All women have both androgens and estrogens. Um, so each sex needs them. It's just in different levels. Women have, of course, much lower androgen and much higher estrogen relative to men. All these prototypical sex hormone, female sex hormones, they all came from testosterone. It's just a matter of how much of it's getting converted. And that's, that's acted through this enzyme called aromatase. And ovaries are just doing this at a much, much higher level than the testes are. And so women are just converting more of this testosterone into the estrogens. Too much insulin actually starts to directly impact that, that enzyme, right? That's right. Well, yes. And, and particularly uh, with cholesterol synthesis and then distribution, it is a bit of a fluid relationship between estrogen, testosterone, estrone, estriol. Those are all different forms of estrogen. Some are more potent. Same thing with mm -hmm. testosterone and, and, and so, and dihydrotestosterone. And yep. so there's uh, similarly, some are more potent than others but that estradiol is the most potent form. And that is created directly from testosterone through aromatase. Yeah. And so then when insulin comes in estrogen, then we have lower levels of estrogen production because of the high insulin. <clears throat> and now we have the, the, the woman who doesn't have enough estrogens to facilitate ovulation. So when insulin comes in, prevents this rise in estrogens. And now we have all these follicles in the ovaries that were developing, waiting to kind of get into the game for one to become the dominant ovulatory follicle. But in the absence of this estrogen spike, we fail to have that one follicle become the dominant and then ovulatory follicle. Normally you would develop one uh, fall, dominant follicle and then that follicle ovulates and becomes what's called the corpus luteum, which then continues that pregnancy until it sees a, an HCG level, which is the pregnancy hormone, and that continues it. But these other follicles, they should go through apoptosis, which is a programmed cell death they go away, they're supposed to go away and kind of dissolve, the body dissolves them in. Similarly, that corpus luteum, which is the remnant of the sack of fluid that the, that the egg was within, that will degrade and go away once that pregnancy is no longer there. It's an interesting process that when you have, when someone has PCOS and they, and they don't have regular menstruation, the reason for that is because they don't ovulate regularly. And so um, that is the cause of oligomenorrhea is that they aren't releasing that egg and then setting off that cascade of hormones to either go towards pregnancy or towards having a period. And, and that can get actually particularly dangerous if you have um, buildup of, 
of the uterine lining getting ready to get a pregnancy and then you don't get people don't get pregnant but that lining never gets the signal to shed and that can eventually become a more dangerous process if it if it doesn't shed and doesn't shed and doesn't shed then those cells that are supposed to reproduce regularly can turn into even some precancer or cancer cells uh, and, and things like that. So that's something that we always are very cognizant of. And it's because they don't have that ovulation and, and then that cascade of hormones telling a person to either get pregnant or to have a period uh, once they have that. So you'd mentioned that when one follicle ovulates, all the other follicles are destroyed through apoptosis, but they are in the absence of the ovulation all the follicles just sort of stick around wondering what to do with themselves. Is that right? And they become the cysts that are the prototypical definition of PCOS. And, and also the unovulated dominant follicles can stick around as well. And so those ones, some of these ones that go through apoptosis really don't grow to be very large at all, but these mm. dominant ones do, but then they don't ovulate. And so some of them are un unovulated dominant follicles we believe some of them are maybe other follicles that haven't gone through apoptosis. And normally what the ovary is, I mean, could certainly small fit in the, in the palm of a hand, right? I mean, quite, quite yeah. like the size of an egg, a little smaller. A little smaller typically, yeah. And then I remember where this ovary, the cystic ovary was almost, a, it was like the size of a kidney. <laughs> some of them can get quite large. Uh, and that's just because the, the physics of a follicle taking up yeah. more space and that stretch of the ovary can definitely, people can feel that. That's why sometimes people have a ruptured cyst and that can be painful. Often people go to the emergency room for something mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. uh, people can feel yep. also that ovulation even. Sometimes people can feel that. This article was published in 2015 and it's entitled, and we'll put this up on the screen, Low Starch, Low Dairy Diet Results in Successful Treatment of Obesity and Comorbidities Linked to Polycystic Ovary Syndrome or PCOS. So Steve, why don't you just kind of give us the lay of the land? What was, who, who were the subjects involved in this study? Primary author, Dr. Jennifer Fai, was my mentor in medical school. She's one of the reasons why I went into obstetrics and gynecology in the first place. She was actually a fertility doctor that treated my wife, who has PCOS. Uh -huh. And so um, this, is, this is an article that I really like. And we saw her as fertility patients. She put us on the diet that she did in this, uh, in this study. My wife would have been excluded from this study uh, for different reasons, but uh, we went on it and we were able to get pregnant. And so this is a, this is near and dear to my heart, but I do like the study. I think it's, it's well-designed. It's not perfect, of course. And what she did was they got 28 patients diagnosed with PCOS. They diagnosed them with PCOS. They have it. And then they had to have the specific BMI and they put them on a diet that was a very low carb and no dairy diet at what they did was they would bring them in for a two hour session with a nutritionist and they would go through uh, their diet, tell them which foods they recommend eating, which ones they don't. They asked them not to change their exercise schedule or routine to, to try to isolate diet and, and not uh, get other factors that people are trying to bring in. Although that, you know, that's always debatable. And then uh, they had them, do this diet for eight weeks and they drew a bunch of labs and, and did some clinical things to see where are they at pre intervention and where did it go post intervention and, uh, and compared those labs to each other through statistical analysis to see if it was statistically significantly different uh, between the same person's labs eight weeks apart. Yeah. So a repeated measure. So pretty powerful when you can compare a subject to herself in this case, it gives you, I know as a, as a publishing scientist, it gives you a lot more statistical power um, to, to, you know, you've powered the study enough to really find some conclusions. It's pretty impressive. You look at the ones with a P value less than 0 0.0001. That's a pretty convincing P value. That means that it's most likely assuredly not chance that caused this, but the actual, some sort of intervention, something to do with the intervention that caused this change. You look at weight in kilograms, there was a change of minus 8.6 on average with a standard deviation of 2.3. So 8.6 kilograms, that's 
huge what how how much glucose do you have in your blood and that went from 95 which is high that's not a that's not what i would call a normal fasting glucose to an average of 86 which is what i would call a more normal fasting glucose so to, uh, clearly brought them out of some metabolic disease the fasting insulin i think is extremely relevant that came down mm-hmm. That means that insulin resistance by half. in my mind went and the down. insulin came down. The insulin came down by half. You, know, I did the diet with my wife, and and it was it, uh, it was the first experience I had with low carb, and it was totally doable. That's impressive. If I had a drug that could do these things, if I had a medicine that I could give someone that would drop their weight by twenty pounds, improve their insulin resistance, I would put. And, and with no adverse effects, man, I would put every single patient on that drug. It just doesn't exist. That's not a drug that exists. But, but the diet exactly did that. And that's, that's pretty impressive statistics. But they stated, considering this dietary intervention allowed for ad libitum intake without calorie or carbohydrate counting or medications, I mean, that is so important. And it makes these kinds of chain dietary changes so much more doable. These were not a bunch of gals who had to be tediously counting everything they were eating. They were given general broad instructions and told they could eat as much as they wanted. And as the, as the authors noted, it was ad libitum. That means freely. You can eat freely. It's not too much of a stretch to say everything got better. 